the lecture is, or at least the dialogue we'll be having will be on Lahore of kings and commoners. And let me begin with uh, a picture. Uh, can we switch the uh, lights off just above? Ed, could you just switch these off? The ones in front of the screen. That's it. Can you see better now? Yes. All right. Now, uh, this is the Western image of a Pakistani, uh, a, be a central bearded figure surrounded by all kinds of nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really to disabuse that notion that I'm grateful to Razi and his team for having given us the opportunity of presenting the softer image of Pakistan and also of countries that are being at the moment vilified by others who I think should know better. Let me, let me begin. Peter Schaefer, who was the uh, playwright and who was involved with um, um, uh, Equius and Amadeus, he said that um, if London is a watercolor, then New York must be an oil painting. Well, if they're a watercolor and an oil painting, then what is Lahore? Well, Lahore is a miniature. And it is really to, can you see? Ah, oh, it's a miniature. And the person who's most associated and who will be the focal point of a discussion that I'll be having with Navina, and I just want to mention that Navina is uh, not only a friend, she keeps calling me uncle, but when I, um, because I had the privilege of knowing her parents, but I just want to confess something. When I grow up, I want to be like Navina. <laughs> but we'll be talking about Jahangir as a focal point of the discussions um, uh, sort of gravitating around um, uh, Lahore. Now, why Jahangir? Because Jahangir in this picture that you see on the right-hand side of the screen is a painting by Bishatar. And it's a very famous one, which is unfortunately not in the Met. It's in the Smithsonian. Um, and it shows Jahangir receiving or giving a book to a Sufi. And the allegory is that here he's preferring Sufism to temporal power. And you see on below that figure is um, uh, the Sultan of Turkey. And below him, uh, James I of England, which was a, an imitation, a copy of a painting done of James I, delivered by Sir Thomas Rowe to Jahangir. And then below that, and that is the most interesting part, a commoner, a painter. And I couldn't understand, and I discussed this with Naveena, as to why in an imperial muraka you should have a commoner introducing himself into the composition. The only explanation I can think of is that perhaps the painting was done over a period of time, and Jangit by this stage had died, and then the painter had the temerity to include himself. <laughs> Let's move to Jangit. The, common, the connection between a king and a commoner was coinage, because it was the one thing that made a continuous connection between one and was represented by the value of the coin. And you see here Jahangir drinking from a cup. It's a, an Islamic tradition. Um, the, there was a, a, a Turkish bey who was asked, why, you know, why are you drinking when it's against Islam? And he said, the Almighty and I have an understanding. <laughs> so Jahangir had an understanding with the Almighty. But these coins, and when you think about it, here was a man who had disseminated to the public what was his... Um, his specific, you know, his weakness and his predilection. <coughs> Why Jahangir? Jahangir, to me, was the, um, an example of genetic secularism. A Hindu mother and a Muslim father. But he was one who was able to balance that dual identity in his life. In when Neblina came, when we had the privilege of taking her around the hall, she was able to see Wazir Khan's mosque, which was built during the reign of, Rad, uh, of um, Shah Jahan. But the reason I've included this here is a tribute to the American artist, Edwin Lord Weeks, who visited Lahore in 1882 and did this um, spectacular painting. But what is interesting here is that the monument is in the backdrop. What is in the foreground are the commoners. The tea stall, it's called an open-air restaurant, like many of the ones you have in New York. The Mughals ruled for a period of 300 years. The Sikhs only for 50 years, and yet they left a dramatic impact upon the visage of what is now Pakistan. And if you were to superimpose a map of the uh, Kingdom of the Punjab, 
onto what is today Pakistan. 80% of Ranjit Singh's kingdom is in fact modern Pakistan. So, sorry. In this spectacular painting, you see kings and commoners jostling um, shoulders with each other. And in the centerpiece is, of course, Maharaja Ranjit Singh. I was trying to find a miniature which would sum up the 100 years of British rule in our part of the world. I'm talking about Pakistan. And the only picture I could think of, which was a superb representation, was by Shazia Sikandar, who spoke earlier. And in this, you see the British, a sole Britisher, supplanting the Mughal um, ruler and sitting in the Jaroka. Again, coinage. On the obverse side, you have the East India Company asserting its authority. And on the reverse side, you have the Persian script giving you the value. And what I find, an analogy, if you like, is that the British, the rulers, and the ruled only met on the rim. One side was British, and one side was local. If I was to continue, um, Lahore, unchanged, if you were to go there today, you'd see approximately the same picture, the Bajhai Mosque, Ranjit Singh Samadhi, and a view done by Lady Canning, Charlotte Canning, who's the um, Queen Victoria's uh, lady-in-waiting. What does a queen do? So, what does a queen do when she can't visit her dominions? Well, the answer is very simple. She brings the dominions to her. And in this case, Queen Victoria couldn't visit India, so she brought India to her. And she commissioned a Darbar Hall for her private home in the Isle of Wight. The designs for it were made by a man called Bhai Ram Singh Mistry. Um, you see him here. Sorry. Um, ah, you see him here. He was at the Mayo School of Arts in Lahore. He was the vice principal, and he created all the designs, then went and constructed what is the Darbar Hall. Um, I'm reminded in this novena of um, Rupert Brooke's fav famous poem about he, he died in the First World War, but before he went off to France, he said, there will always be, and we were talking about Flanders, there will always be a peace in a foreign land that is forever England. There will always be in the Isle of Wight a piece of a foreign land that will be forever the subcontinent. And that is what the Darbar Hall represents. What can be more common than an American millionaires? <laughs> so here we have Doris Duke, who went on a honeymoon with her first husband, and she had a number, but was so inspired by what she saw in the Far East that she built this um, pavilion of jallies. And Navina will be talking later about the importance of jallies, and she'll be referring to it. But here was an example. She built this house called Shangri-La in Hawaii. What fascinated me was that one of the motifs that she had used was something as mundane as a fireplace from the Shish Mahal of the Lahore Fort. So the one that you see on the left is from Shangri-La in Hawaii, and on the right is the original in the Shish Mahal. Razi was kind enough to mention that for 40, 40 years ago, my book, which was a catalog of the Pahari paintings at the Lahore Museum, was published by Sadhvi Park Bennett in 1977 here in New York. Um, if I was to choose out of the 525 pictures, the one that appealed to me most, it would be this one. It was by a man called Nensuk. And here you see a king in the first story looking down at a commoner. And the analogy is the king and the commoner, God, man, his beloved woman, and God and mankind. So at its highest level, there's an element of Sufism in it. Um, just before I hand over to Naveena, I'm going to ask all of you if you could just, you don't have to sing it, but wish her husband, Bernie, who's here in the audience, a happy birthday. It's his birthday today. <laughs> so. But the double whammy is, it's Naveena's birthday tomorrow. <laughs> so Naveena, over to you, dear. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful um, surprise at the end of your <laughs> talk. I, I, um, it really made our birthday special. I, I want to start by saying it's a great privilege to share a stage with you. Uh, not only are you 
celebrated and adored in, across the border in India, but it, in our family, in our, our circle of friends, and your contributions to the world of scholarship um, have been so considerable. So as a curator uh, in Islamic art, we sort of depend a lot on the work that you've done through, through your many contributions. So that's one point of complete intimidation for me. The other point was going to Lahore as an Indian, because we've heard so much about Lahori hospitality and indeed lived up to its reputation. So I went back to Delhi with the, my re, uh, inferiority complex reinforced and said, we must introduce a lot of meat in our cooking and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but uh, coming to the subject of Lahore for me and for the, for the Metropolitan Museum, we are hoping in the future to do an exhibition on the uh, patronage of the Emperor Jahangir, who is intimately associated with Lahore because his um, uh, tomb was there because he spent many years there, and many important figures of his court are, uh, uh, you know, buried in, in Lahore. Lahore plays an important part in Mughal history in this period, uh, but of course it came into the Mughal Empire earlier. And um, I think I can. One more right. Yeah. Right. I think they have to load it. Okay, maybe it's coming. Ed, could you load it? That's it. Okay, yeah. sorry. Maybe we start with it. Mm. So um, in, in the Akbar period, you already have works of art that were made in the city of Lahore, attributed to Lahore. And at the Met, for example, we have this spectacular carpet, which is uh, thought to have been woven in Lahore and was uh, possibly destined to occupy one of the great rooms in Fatehpur Sikri. Mm. That's the thinking about it. But as you can see, it's a, it's a marvel of design and <clears throat> artistic uh, uh, well, execution on, on, and technique as well on all levels. Um, there are also important paintings that were produced in Lahore, illustrated manuscripts, and one of the um, highlights in our galleries are, is, is our pages from the, uh, um, the Khamsa, the quintet of Amir Khosro, Khosro Dehlavi, who was one of the great Sufi figures of, of northern India, and whose um, quintet was illustrated many times in history, but in Lahore in the late 16th century for Akbar was a particularly beautiful copy um, of, of this, of which we have certain pages. And here you see a very interesting meeting between Alexander and Plato in a cave, uh, which is part of one of the stories in the Khamsa. So that really takes us into the, the, the Lahore, the, the traditions and the contributions of the art of Lahore in, in the pre-Jahangir period. But when you come to Jahangir's period, as I mentioned, his, his tomb is, is there, and we spent many happy times walking through and exploring the site. That is, of course, Jahangir's tomb in Lahore. Uh, and when you imagine a world, India and Pakistan united under Mughal uh, rule, you, you, all these borders go away, and you see how relationships existed between uh, Agra, Delhi, Lahore, Kashmir, etc. That, that are harder to understand today with all the sort of barriers in place. Um, what's interesting though, is if you look at the architecture in Agra and you look at the, one of the great tombs of the period, which is the tomb of Itmadu Dola, which was built by, uh, by Noor Jahan, who was uh, Jahangir's wife, for her father, who was Jahangir's vizier. As you can, this was a sort of very tight family circle, mm. which of Persian uh, nobility, uh, who dominated Mughal politics for a good period of time in the Jahangir period, you find that there are many similarities and exchanges that took place. Um, I'm showing you a painting, actually, of Jahangir and, and Vizier Itmadudola, and you'll see immediately that one of the great achievements was the development of very acute portraiture and observation in this period. Um, it had already, already originated in Akbar, but it was developing further in, under Jahangir. Um, but here you have the tomb of Itmadudola in in uh, Agra, which uh, is also an inlaid tomb, marble inlaid tomb. Uh, there's Noor Jahan in the one painting that people accept as her portrait. It's actually in the Raza Rampur Library. Mm. Um, but if you look at the interior or the decorative programs of both these places, you see that uh, closer to me is, uh, is a facade from uh, the, the tomb of Itmadu Dola, which is executed in Pietra Dura inlay. This is a European technique that was introduced in a uh, Florentine right, technique yeah. that was introduced in, by Noor Jahan reputedly yeah. in, in the construction of her father's mm -hmm. tomb. But then look at the interior of Jahangir's tomb and you see that that same art form mm -hmm. has developed a slightly different styles, maybe more naturalistic, more organic uh, mm -hmm. in many ways. But it's a fantastically preserved interior and it's yeah. interesting to be able to compare the two. 
Um, in Lahore, we were also able to visit uh, the tomb of Asif Khan, who is mm -hmm. Jahan's brother, who lived on past, uh, Shah, uh, past Jahangir's death quite, quite a bit further, and he's buried as, in part of the same complex. And it was moving to go there and see the effect of the Sikh um, uh, sort of uh, engagement, let's say, with that site, because it's actually been stripped bare of almost everything. It's a sort of uh, ghost of a tomb, mm. but the, the interior is more or less, got, it's got the cenotaph and it's got part of the ceiling on mm. the inside, which is spectacular Mughal design. Um, and in some ways, it sort of speaks m more powerfully to what's become of the Mughals, the shadow that remains of their greatness. Um, and I found that a very moving experience to go to that particular tomb. But Lahore also had its exotic visitors under Jahangir, and among them was the dodo bird, which you can see <laughs> recorded here. This is a very extraordinary story because the dodo became extinct in about 1687, and one of the only known observed depictions of the dodo bird is in the court of Jahangir, and it was probably uh, introduced into his uh, zoolo uh, zoological gardens, his aviary, uh, that was in Lahore. There mm -hmm. were several Mughal aviaries in the period, but he had one in Lahore. And so right in the middle of this page, you see the dodo bird, which gets dodologists very excited. You know, that is a, that is a field. <laughs> and, um, but it wasn't the only exotic visitor. You also had an African zebra, yes. and a tur turkey cock, and an African chameleon, and uh, flamingos, and other extraordinary visitors to and Lahore. Course it was done by Mansoor. You, yes. The inscription. Inscription, yeah. yes. Yeah. So um, these are some of the, the things that we hope to look, you know, study and enjoy bringing together for this project and then presenting to the public and doing a catalogue and lots and lots of back and forth with Lahore and other parts of the subcontinent. Um, but there was one other way in which we were able to bring Lahore to the Metropolitan Museum and I'll end by um, showing you this last slide which is by uh, the artist Imran Qureshi who was commissioned uh, a few years ago to do the rooftop commission, which is a very prestigious contemporary art uh, space at the Metropolitan. And he uh, chose to paint it with this distinctive style that he's become very famous for. And against the New York skyline, you found uh, the strong imprint of Lahore and the creative talent that is being produced at the National College of Arts and, and other places in Lahore. So I feel that there's we're already in a great conversation and we look forward to much, much more. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Round of applause. And <laughs> well, first of all, thank you very much indeed. Um, and you've underlined the organic relationship between Met and Lahore, but also the linear relationship of a continuity of tradition. Um, Imran's is the latest and goes back to uh, the period when patrons were uh, the ones who determined the um, quality of work that was being done. Um, by the way, the dodo, um, it's not just of interest to zoologists, but also to politicians in Pakistan. Oh. <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> they empathize with it, and they're happy to see their ancestry explained in uh, paintings. Um, we share an admiration for Jahangir, you and I. Um, I've just mentioned about the, um, this um, genetic secularism, if you like, because I thought that it was something which was vital. I hadn't, I hadn't imagined it, I hadn't taken it that seriously, until a lady called Sudha, um, uh, Krishnamurti, um, uh, Narayana uh, Murthy's wife came, and she'd asked to see the, um, the tomb of Jahangir, and I said, why? And she said, because he was the first secular ruler that we had in India who drew within his own persona the two traditions of Hinduism and Islam and, um, and perfectly he was quite comfortable with it. I've explained my uh, interest in Jahangir. What was it that appeals to you so much about him? Why do you admire him so much? Why have you chosen him as the subject for your next exhibition? Well, um, Jahangir is arguably the greatest aesthete of all the Mughal emperors. He truly, deeply cared about art, and he understood it in a way that was unique to him, and um, sort of drew up everything to a very high pinnacle. 
and particularly the art of painting. He uh, bragged about it in his memoirs. He described how he could recognize the hand of a particular artist. Um, and so we know already that the art of painting was uh, at an extraordinary high level. He actually fired half the artists that he inherited from his father's mm -hmm. karkhanas, and he only kept the very, very best. And he was in a deep, intimate uh, relationship with his artists mentally and, and, and emotionally and uh, visually and artistically. So it was, it was a very, uh, for an art historian, it's just a fascinating um, coming together of artist and patron. But what's not known about the Jahangir period as much, and which is a kind of interesting challenge, is, is the other types of art forms that flourished. For example, the rise of the object, the jeweled mm -hmm. object, the precious object, uh, its status, jade carving. Yeah, yeah. There are many, even textile design, mm -hmm. there are many mysteries about the, the period. But we also know that we are deeply in debt to that period. For example, uh, the concept of a fully flowering uh, plant mm -hmm. is the hallmark of Mughal art. You mm -hmm. see it on the, in the reliefs of the Taj Mahal and all the great forts that the Mughals built. Um, you see it on the textiles that are worn up to today, you know, where you Indeed. see a repeating fl floral yep. form, even like mine today, and that's lasted 400 years almost. Um, but this is a, a conceptual, uh, a birth of a concept of, of isolating a flower and observing it in naturalistic detail, and then covering a surface in repetition or, you, or putting it in niches and so on, different types of design um, designs. Um, and it became a sort of aesthetic achievement, but also, as I said, a conceptual um, break with the idea of the arabesque, which was a repeating form that covered surfaces. And that is a great sort of Islamic, um, mm -hmm. the language of Islam. Um, but it's not unrelated to that. Uh, how did it come about? is one of the questions. Its uh, emergence has been generally attributed to uh, European herbals in the court. Mm -hmm. Yet everyone knows that that argument doesn't really add up because the herbals came at different times. It's not very well understood how it would have worked anyway. Uh, there was no color associated quite often with the kind of um, scientific studies that were coming in from Europe. And um, it's still not clear what inspired this incredible achievement, this artistic achievement. So my hunch is that it's got to do with possibly, I'm just revealing my cards here, I could be completely wrong and mm -hmm. eating my words, but um, it could be to do with Jahangir's relationship with Kashmir, which was a very important di <coughs> dimension of, of the period. Absolutely. And so I'm excited to advance that to really go, I, I tried to go up to Kashmir with the botanist mm -hmm. and was foiled by the Indian army, but I, <laughs> I shall try once again. Well, they're threatened um, by a botanist. <laughs> yes. You know, so yes, um, yes. There, there's a lot of exciting research to be done and challenges, and I think just intellectually and artistically, okay. that's what's so fascinating about the period. Tell me, um, <clears throat> was Jahangir bipolar? <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I say it, I should defend the accusation, here was this man who could, as Naveen has just said, he could distinguish um, an artist's hand from the uh, eyebrow of a, of a subject or from the eye, and he, could, he boasted that he could uh, discern. And yet at the same time, he, and, and, uh, he could um, order that when his favorite elephant was being bathed, he noticed it was shivering, and so the water should be heated so that the elephant could bathe in comfort. And yet, with his son, when there was a rebellion, he had his followers flayed alive and also blinded his son. So how do you reconcile this duality, this schizophrenic um, duality in his personality? Well, I, I sort of see it in two ways. I mean, one is to do with um, Jahangir as an individual. Mm -hmm. I mean, as an individual, we know quite a lot about him because he's left his memoirs to us. And he, yes. in those, he reveals a kind of a slightly cold, uh, almost scientific mind where he's curious about what would happen if I was to stick a knife into you and twist it seven times. I'm not quite, but you know, it's, it's, it's sort of diabolical curiosity and he follows up on a lot of his, um, you know, sort of in, impulses. I mean, famously, as we were talking earlier, the death of Inayat Khan, Khan yeah. one of his young officers who uh, we have actually the portrait at the Met of him as a young, healthy officer holding swords, uh, the emperor's swords wrapped up in, in Persian textiles and uh, in full health and bloom. And uh, like uh, Jahangir himself, Inayat Khan was an, a user of opium, opium. and uh, he got very badly addicted to opium, and Jahangir heard that uh, he was very close to death and had, had lost all of his um, vitality. So instead of 
sort of sending sympathy and flowers, he had him brought into court because he was fascinated to see what a man who was so close to death looked like, mm-hmm. this particular man he knew. And when he saw Inayat Khan, he was so uh, struck by his, by, his, by his appearance that he had his court artist record him in one of the greatest portraits of a dying man ever made, in, 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 certainly in the 17th century. And three days later, by his own pen, he tells us Inayat Khan was dead. So well, that kind of yeah. cold curiosity. Yeah. But I was going to say the other thing that I sort of think of Jahangir's bipolarism in relationship to is, is in fact, in some sense, the coming enlightenment. Mm. Because European enlightenment of the 18th century largely was um, you know, sort of seen as a kind of scientific, uh, had scientific dimensions to it, and was preceded by a period of collecting and scientific investigation. And Jahangir was very much like that. He collected natural objects and artificial objects. Mm. He, he made the distinction between them. He had this kind of scientific interest in things. He had a kind of the capacity for, for being as cruel as some of the Enlightenment artists were, and uh, I mean uh, philosophers were. And I won't get into the details, I'm not qualified to talk, but whatever little I've read of some of the scientific advances that were made in the Enlightenment were made at a terrible cost to animals, for example, ex- medical uh, experiments and things like that, that, are, you know, that sort of are hauntingly and s- weirdly similar to some mm. of the things that you mm. see in, in the Tuzuke Jahangiri, uh, which is his uh, memoir. You've hinted at dynastic cruelty, okay, and I'm now going to take a parallel, which is um, the Mughals ruled for 300 years, the Romanovs ruled for 300 years, and today we're finding that um, many of the, for example, in the Soviet period, many of the cities and streets which were named after the Romanovs, um, St. Petersburg, etc., were renamed and are being renamed again. And I'm thinking about a country where they are beginning to change the names of Mughal emperors and are altering them, okay, more in line with their modern perception. Do you think the Mughals will suffer the same fate as the Romanovs? Unfortunately, they might because um, the, the rate of name change is very, very high in India at the moment and, um, and it's completely, uh, you know, it's motivated by you know, I, I, I'm, again, I'm not qualified to say uh, and pass judgment and all that, but I, I have passed judgment and said that, um, that I, it's just motivated by sort of narrow political concerns of the moment and, uh, and without a really adequate um, respect for history, uh, not just the history of naming places and so on, but the meaning of a name and how names uh, add layers of historical richness to identity to whole societies, and when you start diminishing that or, or compromising on that, what are you doing to your people as a whole, and what gives you that right, apart from the democratic uh, vote, which I admit is a slight uh, problem in my, in my argument, but, but still, I, I still don't think that um, it's right. I actually wrote an article uh, on, on the renaming of Aurangzeb Road mm-hmm. in Delhi, because Aurangzeb in particular, he's the last of the so-called great Mughal emperors, has been particularly vilified, and he, uh, they changed one of the grandest roads in Delhi to um, the name of, of a recent uh, president of India. And, and when I wrote an article about it, I got tons and tons of hate mail. Um, so it's, it's very depressing, and, and um, anyway. Hmm. I, I, I'm so glad you brought up the point. What, what do you think about it? Do you feel... Wrong I mean, side of the border. Wrong side of the border. I think there's um, the danger, um, Navina, is that those who forget history are condemned to relive it, but those who forget their history are condemned to forfeit it. And I think there is a real danger that um, if we begin to rewrite or if we begin to create um, a new narrative about uh, the continuity of a historical tradition, then there's a danger that we'll be substituting it with something which was not necessarily linear, which was not organic, which was not natural to that, um, to that era. Uh, I think it's, it should be possible to be proud uh, of your heritage, regardless of what its origins were. Um, you don't have to be judgmental about it. Create history, certainly, mm-hmm. but you don't have to rewrite it. But that's a personal opinion of mine. Um, you, we, we were talking about patrons and the importance of patrons um, in any cultural um, uh, you know, uh, media. Patrons provided the inspiration, and of course the artisans and commoners provided the perspiration. Um, <laughs> who do you see as the next great eight patrons of art? Now that the kings 
have become commoners. Gosh. I'd be a very rich art dealer if I, if I knew, knew the that. that. <laughs> but um, no, that's a really interesting question because we are seeing, especially in our part of the world, we're seeing a fundamental shift in, the, in that pat- pattern of artistic production where mm-hmm. you had a patron and an artist and the rise of an individual artist who doesn't necessarily have a patron but will produce a work of art and hope to find a patron mm-hmm. is an inversion of the normal pattern and that's led to many new forms of expression, new forms of artistic expression from the individual who's able to express himself more as an individual um, to uh, sort of openness to influences from around the world which you, you know, and and sort of random uh, influences that come in 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 unexpected ways. So how how is it going to, who would be the great patrons of the future? Would you like to take a guess? I had to give us a clue. Matt? (laughs) <laughs> Why not? You've done it just now with Imran. Yeah. So um, this is the new, 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 the new wave. My reason for asking this question was really um, uh, deeper in the sense that um, the, the patrons were the ones who determined the product. Okay? Artists, and it, this is something I find very unusual, that monuments, the Mughals were noted for their monuments. And yet you do not find, I may be wrong, I have not been able to come across any single miniature which, which demonstrates the construction of a palace, which you can identify. I showed you a miniature earlier, but not one which is of the Taj Mahal under construction, Fatehpur and Sikri under construction, per se. I know there are certain uh, in the, um, in the Akbar Nama and in the Yangi Nama, etc., there are various uh, individual buildings which you can associate, the Jaroka, for example, in the Red Fort, but not the construction of these buildings. And you would imagine when there's something happening at such an epic level, at an epic scale, you think the artist, if he can paint a dodo, he can certainly paint the Taj Mahal under construction. Doesn't happen. Um, And it's a bit like the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians. You never find any representation of how the pyramids were constructed or how the tombs were. I recognize it was this kind of sacred, uh, sacred um, obligation there. But my reason for asking this is as far as modern collectors are concerned or modern collections are concerned, the Met has an unrivaled collection of Islamic art now. Um, and you've got various local patrons. You know, the Qatris have come in in a big way. Um, but they're buying ready-made art. They're not commissioning it. They're buying off the shelf, as it were. Um, so is it going to now be for anybody who wants to see these things, they'll have to come to institutions and um, museums rather than um, uh, you know, see it available yeah. in, in the public? I? Well, I, again, I think it's very interesting the role that art is playing in society now. I, I almost feel as though when one has lost hope in political leadership and, and, and in any kind, uh, sort of so many spheres of, of society for the really serious problems that we're facing, particularly to do with environment and particularly to do with um, kind of social fabric. Uh, it is the artists, the writers, the poets, um, though, and that's why the literature festival is so important, uh, these sorts of spaces that, that create the opportunity, the dialogues, the exchange of ideas, the meeting of people that leads to creative solutions for things and at least gives an opportunity for expression. Because I, I think one of the things that I felt a lot, and I felt it, I've been in India for the last three and a half months, and in Pakistan I've been giving talks and meeting people, and I felt a kind of psychic pain almost in people as they see their worlds changing. There's enormous change going on. Uh, shifts of different types, new ideas, new ideologies, but the physical fabric of society and of places and spaces also changing, the sense of huge things happening around the world. And it is the artistic voices that I find so incredibly um, sort of expressive at this point, being able to put a, put a, uh, give, give expression to all that we're experiencing. So the patron might be the, the challenges that we face mm-hmm. and the producers are the, and the artists are, are rising to that challenge and the consumers are going to be all of us because we need it. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a sort of perfect circle. Unfortunately, it's come about at the moment when there's so many challenges, but that's what I'm seeing it as. Okay. Um, we had William Dalton from in the hall the other day and he was talking about his new book, The Kohinoor. And I was fascinated because I'd written about it some time ago. And I was fascinated that the Kohinoor had been reduced from its original 186 carats to 107, I think. Um, 
And of course, there's now an argument as to what should happen with the Kohinoor. Um, you know that the Punjab was first, um, was in 1947, two thirds was uh, in um, what is now Pakistan, one third went to India and it became East Punjab, now part of uh, the Indian Punjab. Um, but what fascinated me was that, of course, the Kohinoor, the first question I asked Willie was, um, you reduced it from, it was reduced from 186 to 107. What happened to the other 79 carats? You know, I mean, okay, we're haggling over the 107, but what about the other? And he said, I have no idea. I said, well, somebody's, you know, you should be able to trace it because somebody's sitting on 79 carats of the Kohinoor. Um, and it can't be just this kind of finder's fee or a cutter's fee. There, there must have been something more serious than that. The second was, I said, if it's the, it is a cursed stone, all right, as they believe, and then if any person, any male who wears it um, is cursed, then surely there's a sense in cutting it and sending two thirds to one government <laughs> and sending the other third to the other government and hoping that it will somehow precipitate <laughs> a downfall of respective wearers. But anyway, that's a flippant thought. Um, <laughs> um, but talking about the Kohinoor, it raises an issue, and I'd like your opinion on this. Most of the Western collections, and certainly the ones in the United Kingdom, etc., the origin of those collections, whether they were the Dalhousie collection, whether they were the Clive collection, the Powers, etc., we know the origins of them because they were, in fact, appropriated from India. Okay? The modern collections that you have built up, you are very, very careful about provenance. Mm -hmm. Today, there is a kind of nationalistic acquisition, acquisitive in, you know, uh, interest that they want their heritage back. Have you had any such um, claims against the Met collection? Um, well, yes, and the Mets had to, you know, meet those challenges. Uh, the, it's not the only museum. Uh, I think many mm. European museums have faced many uh, issues of repatriation. I mean, that's a kind of broad area, and there are different legal and historical contexts within which these claims are made. Um, in the case of the uh, Islamic department of the Met, for example, the Turkish government is very, very active and has mm -hmm. been tracing individual tile panels um, and doing their own research, and they are engaged in, in many conversations with museums such as ours about individual tile panels. And if it's deemed that they were not acquired in the correct way, they put a claim, and, and quite often those claims are honored. Um, but it's also been the case with, with Italy and Greece, um, you know, in the classical antiquities that are often claimed back uh, by European nations mm -hmm. such as that. Uh, India and Pakistan haven't yet, I don't think, been as active as the other countries have been. But India, I mean, there have been issues, I guess now there's been smuggling of temple statues, uh, outright theft and so on, and that has been uh, addressed. The, the interesting thing here is that uh, these borderlines are all very difficult to, to understand because antiquities acts, antiquities laws, were put into our part of the world in British times. Mm. And in, at independence, both these countries basically ratified what was already in existence. And subsequent amendments to those acts have uh, you know, changed things around a little bit, but basically there's a blurry line between um, you know, what's legitimate and what's not for export and, and isn't. So that's, that's an ongoing question. The Met has is, is been okay so far. Been, we have a very active legal department and a very transparent scheme, particularly when it comes to World War II. Hmm. And I think the most, uh, uh, you know, there's, a, there's been a lot of um, repatriation issues to do with looting during World War II, hmm. and there's an open register of, of items that belong to uh, Jewish families mm -hmm. that were just looted and sold by very well-known dealers and so that's all sort of an, an open system now so mm -hmm. one can actually get online and, and review it for oneself but it, it is a it is a sort of ongoing issue. The British are very comfortable with this because everything that they took out went before the first second world war. <laughs> yeah, so they're all right they say mm -hmm. home and dry. Um, I'm going to conclude with um, before we have Q&A, with a quotation by Khalil Gibran. Yesterday, we obeyed kings and bent our necks before emperors. But today, we kneel only to truth, follow only beauty, and obey only love. 
And that, I think, is a beautiful summation of what I genuinely and sincerely believe to be the purpose of a Lahore Literary Festival, which is that you can have a scholar of Navina's background and of her talent and of her expertise being able to share a platform with somebody from Lahore, to be able to visit Lahore and be inspired by it, to be excited by it, and we hope that you'll come back again, okay? Um, but it, to me, that is the, the quality of occasions like this and the utility of the um, Lahore Literary Festival. So once again, I began by thanking Rezi. Let me conclude our part of the session by thanking you and your team again for making, and the Asia Society for making it possible for us to share a platform. Can I now throw it open for Q&A? Please, uh, but briefly, questions, not statements, and certainly not the Akwanama. <laughs> Please, yes, of course. Did you uh, go to a North Delhi bazaar and find any clues? Uh, find did any? You go, did you go to a North Delhi bazaar and, and find any traces of home of a North and whatever the Metha story is? Did you say um, anything about that? So this is Anarkali, who is... Um, a great colorful figure of history. Yes, we went to Anarkali's tomb, um, and we, it's a fascinating site. It's been converted into an archival space, That's right? That's right, yes, Punjab archives. Punjab archives, and so, but you see her tomb, uh, the cenotaph has been shifted from its central position to mm. the side, and, but it's intact there. It's a marble sarcophagus with the 99 names of God in a uh, proper inlay style, very similar to Jahangir's, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that, that still exists, but the interior of the tomb itself has been turned into a very actually exciting archival space. It mm -hmm. was quite a wonderful uh, place to visit. But I want to clarify that we didn't shift, when I say we, the Pakistan government didn't shift the cenotaph. It was done by the British when they converted it into a church. It was the first cathedral of Lahore, and it was called, and only the British would have this talent, Anarkali's tomb became St. James's church. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, by the way, just an answer, I'm not sure, you obviously know about Anarkali. Um, everybody assumes that she was the dancing girl who somehow caught the attention of um, uh, the Prince Charles of her time, the Crown Prince, as he was. Anyway, um, and we all assume this, that she was in Tumna, but when you think about it, it was the purpose of a dancing girl to attract the attention of the Crown Prince. I mean, that's what she was there for. Sean Benegal, when I took him around, as I did to you, uh, took you around, Navina, he made an observation which is in fact supported by William Finch, who visited uh, Lahore in 1615. And he passes this tomb under construction, and he says it is one of Akbar's young wives. Now, we dismissed it as historians said, no, no, the guys got it wrong, you know. But when you think about it, here was a tomb that was built Years after Jahangir, after her death, because it was done in 1618, it was years after he got married to Noor Jahan, so she was very accommodating. <laughs> Why should he build a tomb years after he marries his wife for a dancing girl? The only condition I could think of and why there should have been such, a, you know, such an extreme form of punishment was that the king, Akbar, could, count, could not accept that one of his young wives was being hit upon by his son. And that is where the trauma took place. So think about it, okay? Um, just on a lighter note, my contractor took forever building my house. So one day I said to him, this tomb of, you know, the story about Anarkali is absolute rubbish. He said, no, 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 you've written books about it. I said, yeah, I'm telling you, absolute rubbish. He said, no, but she was entombed. I said, listen, she wasn't entombed alive. She died of old age, waiting for a contractor like you to finish the war. <laughs> Please, next question. Uh, yes, please, uh, of course. I grew up in Lahore reading uh, Krishnamurti and Yogananda's uh, autobiography of the Yogi. I, I'm from Lahore. Uh, I work as a librarian in New York. And I look at the reading choices that people make and what relationship identity and religion and nationality have with that frequent choice, like we are, what we read. read. So in a sense, when you look at Pakistan and India and the transference of conflict from one generation to the other, like we spend billions and billions on weapons, the two countries, they're the same people, they're divided by propaganda and ideology. So I am wondering, has there been any movement in education where these two people can recognize their oneness and unity? 
Were there one community? Has there been any movement in education? Right. Um, yeah. Again, I'm not really um, qualified I, I, to say. I, I can say what I've been told is that actually the direction is in a different way altogether. I mean, it's a different direction because I haven't. I can't say that I know this for a fact, but it's frequently said in India that all the textbooks of the next generation of school children are being altered around so that the history reads in a completely different way. So that's one thing. I don't know how it's been altered, but if that's the case, they're unlikely. They're probably sort of building up individual lineages. Another great flashpoint for this, for, for this idea of people, who are the people, has been the whole discussion on Aryans and the original inhabitants of the Indian subcontinent. And this is, uh, again, I am not an ancient Indian sco uh, scholar, so I, it's just by hearsay and what I've read in, in very superficial sort of places. But my impression is that uh, one of the uh, big ideas is to somehow claim that Aryans originated in India and that the Indian subcontinent was inhabited by people not who came there as foreigners and have now established for after three or four, five thousand years a civilization, but that they originated there. It's gotten pretty crazy, and I think that a lot of non-trained scholars, I mean, historians are writing history and politicians are writing history. People who have no training in history are writing history, but uh, which is why it's very interesting. I, I'm sorry, I was missing today's panel in the morning, which I was, I'm looking forward to seeing online later, which is really to do with the question of a post-truth era and the authenticity of fact and, 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 and the position of arguments. But this is what's happening, as far as I can tell, in the, in the historical sphere now. I don't see it arguing that we're one people. If anything, it, the concerns seem to be quite different. But of course, it's not, being, it's not history as written by proper historians, as far as I can tell. Good. Let me um, conclude. Um, I think Rachel would like us to wind up. Let me conclude by thanking all of you um, on behalf of um, Navina. Uh, for being such a wonderful audience and being so responsive and so attentive. So thank you once thank again. You. Thank you.